Okay. okay. You, yeah. Okay. You. Yeah. Sure. Oh, there's that usual hush. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vera Yelenek. I'm divisional dean of the Center for Global Affairs at the School of Professional Studies. Uh, our CGA events are sort of winding down. I'm not going to bore you with what we've done and what we've accomplished. Uh, but the robust turnout this evening obviously speaks to the fact that you're all very interested, not only in the topic, uh, which is political corruption, but also with our two guests, uh, Lawrence Lessig and... and um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Zephyr Teachout, <laughs> and our moderator, Regina Joseph. It's been a long week, even though we're only halfway through it. Uh, the, the whole event is the brainchild of Regina Joseph, who is sitting there in that white sweater, uh, who's this evening's moderator, who's a member of our adjunct faculty, and concurrently with this event is running a two-day hackathon with our graduate students. Uh, taken together, these are the first steps in exploring a Futures Lab initiative, which will be, pro which will, uh, be devoted to providing strategic foresight on global issues. Uh, Regina will speak more and more effectively to the merits of this type of analysis and we'll also introduce our distinguished uh, guests for this evening. Uh, I, however, uh, will have the pleasure of speaking about Regina. Uh, she has the status as one of the what is called super forecasters who were identified in the four-year judgment project good judgment. <laughs> no, what, good judgment project funded by the U.S. intelligence community and featured in the New York Times bestseller, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction, by Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. She's the founder of, and I'll probably mispronounce it, Regina, is it Sibilink, an international consultancy devoted to providing strategic foresight on global issues through futures forecasting and training for clients like the OSCE, NATO, the UN, various ministries, and other uh, multinational corporations. She's had a, a wide-ranging career in the geopolitical sector, having been a senior research fellow at the Klingdale Institute in The Hague in the Netherlands. A think, it's a think tank based there, and she launched their first futures division. She's also had a long career in the private sector, recognized for pioneering work in media and in technology, a factor in her bringing the first course on cognitive computing to the School of Professional Studies. It'll begin this spring, and it'll be the first deployment of IBM Watson's supercomputer around matters of global affairs and policy. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of Blender, the, first, the world's first digital magazine, and she's held numerous positions for traditional media companies, ranging from Forbes to Hearst to Time Warner. And she continues to writing and for a variety of publications and media outlets, including International Relations and Security Network, Foreign Policy, Reuters, and many others. She's a Thomas J. Watson Fellow, received two BAs in English and Philosophy from Hamilton College, and her Master's in International Relations or Global Affairs from the Center for Global Affairs. Besides being an alum and now a member of our adjunct faculty, uh, Regina is working with Professor Michael Oppenheimer, who's sitting here in the first row, rebranding the Master's in International Relations concentration and giving it a future specialization. Please join me in welcoming Regina and her guests.
Thank you so much, Vera, and welcome to all of you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that you chose uh, to join us this evening, weather's not so nice, uh, for this inaugural event. Is, is my, am I double mic? Everybody can hear me okay. Uh, to join us for this inaugural event of the, uh, of the CGA Futures Lab. Uh, here at CGA. So as someone who uh, works on forecasting geopolitical uh, uh, events, I have to admit that good fortune had a slight edge over applied foresight in ensuring that a discussion with uh, our two guests and the two leading scholars on, of political corruption would exactly coincide with such a historic change in New York this week. Um, indeed, it would be almost impossible uh, to actually have a discussion like this about political corruption without taking note of what is occurring uh, in the city's capital. So for, for those of you who may not have read this in the papers on Monday, the New York State Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver uh, was convicted on all seven counts of uh, federal corruption, uh, despite a two-decade reign as one of the most powerful and one of the most feared uh, legislators here in New York. Um, and the push against uh, uh, influence peddling continues with the Skelos trial that is ongoing. And it exposes the wide-ranging existence uh, and the extent of favor trading, um, a, a practice whose illicit dimension has been entrenched for so long that even legislators in Albany were saying that, yes, but this is how business gets done. And indeed, the nature of political corruption is something that across many parts of the world is still considered business as usual. And the World Bank, the United Nations, the IMF, many NGOs, multilateral organizations will frequently point out that one of the primary scourges in the world is political corruption. And the, as it's, it's a critical driver in almost everything from poverty to inequality to environmental degradation, as well as, obviously, as unrepresentative uh, uh, governance. So there's a lot of ground to cover, um, so, and only so much time. So I'm going to get into it by introducing our esteemed guests. Uh, to my right um, is Zephyr Teachout, who, uh, by the way, published a fantastic article in the Huffington Post yesterday on Sheldon Silver's legacy. Uh, I urge you all to read it. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, uh, professor Teachout is an associate professor at, uh, of law at Fordham University, and she's also served as a law professor at Duke. Uh, a university, her alma mater, where she received her law degree as well as her uh, master's in, in political science. And she's also been a visiting lecturer at University of Vermont. She shares affinities with Professor Lessig, having served as a non-resident fellow uh, at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law. And she currently serves as the CEO and board chair of the May Day uh, Political Action Committee, a position originally held by Professor Lessig. Uh, Professor Teachout is a co-founding executive director of the Fair Trial Initiative and has served as national director of the Sunlight Foundation, as well as the director of online organizing for Howard Dean's campaign. She's been a staff attorney at the Center for Death Penalty Litigation and clerked for Chief Judge Edward R. Becker, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, she's also the author of numerous articles, as well as a fantastic book called Corruption in America, From Benjamin Franklin's Snuffbox to Citizens United. Uh, and aside from those impressive credentials, uh, she practices what she preaches. Uh, she ran as the Democratic candidate for uh, the governor of the state of New York against Andrew Cuomo uh, and garnered an extremely respectable showing uh, in the face of uh, the entrenched Cuomo legacy in New York. Now, uh, uh, I'm also very pleased, uh, no less impressive, impressive of course, is, is uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig. Uh, he is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and was formerly the director of the MNJ, Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Uh, prior to rejoining the Harvard faculty, Professor Lessig was a professor at Stanford Law, uh, where he founded the school's Center uh, for Internet and Society, and he was also at the University of Chicago. He clerked for Judge Richard Richard Posner on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and Justice Antonin Scalia uh, on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Professor Lessig serves on the board of Creative Commons, MapLight, 
Brave New Film Foundation, the American Academy in Berlin, AXA Research Fund, and iCommons.org. And he's on the advisory board of the Sunlight Foundation as well. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Association, and he's received numerous awards, including the Free Software F Foundation's Freedom Award, the Fast Case 50 F Award, and he's been named one of Scientific American's top 50 visionaries. Aside from those credentials, uh, Professor Lessig also practices what he preaches. Uh, he, uh, until last month, was Democratic candidate for the <laughs> presidency of the United States. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to uh, have both of these esteemed guests join us. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming them. <laughs> And with that, let's get right to it. So we're not going to touch on, we're not going to go very long on this, but would love to have you give your impressions of what does the Sheldon Silver conviction and the ongoing trial of the Skeela says, what do you think reform on political corruption in this state? Um, yes, no, I was going to say that when you called me up, you said, I'm going to have this event, and that's the week that Silver's going to get <laughs> convicted, super forecaster. <laughs> <laughs> so you can tell me what's happening yeah. next. Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, the, Albany wants us to do absolutely nothing. So there is an incredible push to treat this, and you can hear it in the language with the way that politicians are responding to the um, silver conviction, is that it's sad. Um, we don't need a special session on ethics. We got to push forward on the things that we've already been pushing for. Governor Cuomo yesterday said, I don't think there is an appetite for um, ethics reform. So there's the use of the sort of passive language. <laughs> um, so just to be honest, the default um, is not that it will lead to change. And it really will take, I think, active protest and the public responding, and also the press responding, saying that we, we can't do more. Because it's not just silver. It is, it is a very deep, entrenched machine and way of doing business. And um, the reason it's so important, and far more important, I think, than the Skelos trial, is that it was a, a the, basically the federal crimes with which he was charged all required a quid pro quo, but none of them required an explicit quid pro quo. None of them required any kind of deal or public statement. I will uh, push this um, luxury developer tax break in exchange for you d directing legal fees my way. Nonetheless, the jury found that um, there had been an unspoken understanding and deal between um, Silver and uh, both uh, luxury developers and a, um, a doctor. And that does actually, separate from the kinds of reforms we do, I do think that does uh, probably terrifies many uh, New York lawmakers, uh, because I think there's often a sense that if you aren't a buffoon, um, you can get away with a, a lot of um, sort of cash for, uh, cash for policy. But what I hope, of course, is that it leads to a lot more people running for office, um, challenging incumbents, saying, if you aren't going to um, actually push for um, a public financing system, some kind of change in the way that we fund the basic structure, you're not serious about um, a corruption in New York State. Because what I believe is that um, you know, Silver's personality is sort of complicated and it's a bit of a mystery to us. He was taking in all this money and just sitting on it. He wasn't buying diamonds or, or cars, just collecting cash. And the question is why? And I've talked to a lot of press in the last couple of days. You know, why was he doing this? And I, I tend to think that our system of uh, private financing of elections sort of leads to a tendency to just get so used to trading favors for donations that it's very easy to start trading favors for uh, uh, basically private, private benefit. It just softens you up in a way. And I think it's really important that we have a system that allows you to make policy decisions without talking to the, the wealthiest interests. So my hope is that it leads in 2017 to a public financing system in New York State. That's my hope. Let's take that into a national, the, the national lens. Um, especially given your experience, how do you see the, the sort of the, the micro view of what's taking place within New York State uh, uh, reflected in what is going on at the national level? Well, one, one striking feature of 
the federal government prosecuting in New York is that it replicates a pattern the federal government has with respect to corruption around the world. There's like an example of corruption, which is quid pro quo. And New York is the handy third world nation that uh, is being targeted here. But if it weren't New York, we'd be looking to third world nations around the globe and talking about these corrupt quid pro quo economy of influences that define for the federal government what is the crime in corruption. Um, but what's troubling about that frame is that it makes it sound like what's going on at the federal level is OK. Right? That, um, that what Congress engages in, which I'm sur sure is not what Silver did, um, what members of Congress engage in is fine. Um, and so we have corruption, bad stuff, New York, the third world, um, and democracy, which is what goes on uh, at, in Congress. But of course, that's completely wrong. Um, in fact, I think uh, you know, the kind of corruption that goes on in Washington um, which doesn't involve criminal acts, doesn't involve explicit quid pro quos, but is a system of dependence that can't help but steer members of Congress away from the proper dependence on the people, is ultimately a more virulent form of corruption than the kind of corruption you see in New York. Um, uh, because it's in plain sight. Nobody needs to hide anything. You don't have to hide the money uh, in this system. You, Broad, broadcast, you brag about the fact that you raised $20 million for the Democratic Party. Um, uh, and the measure of your worth as a member of Congress is your ability to raise money. We hand out committee chairs. Uh, we hand out perks like pages as a function of how much money you're able to raise. Um, and the whole focus of policymaking, I think really over the last 20 years has become distorted by this this huge demand that has developed to be uh, funding in this particular way. So um, whereas, of course, I look at what happened in New York and I'm saddened and, and happy that there's prosecution and hopeful this might finally turn New York and the governor in particular around to delivering on the promise he made when he ran to bring about public funding. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, I hope it doesn't confuse people. I, by making it seem like, well, we have criminal states, and then we have democracy, and we don't have to worry about the other places we call democracy. And that raises a very interesting point, because when people think about corruption, it's easy to point to the very visible examples of it, whether you're talking about outright bribery in places like China or Indonesia, where both of which have active anti-corruption programs currently in place. Um, Whereas in the cases like this, where even legislators see this as something that is just so commonplace that it's not even worth talking about it as in its criminal or illicit dimensions. So, so given the fact that it hides in plain sight, how can you, how can you within a, a, a democratic state like the United States, where you have people who have access to information and in, in media, how can there be some type of spark that starts to really change the script in the minds of the public? What, is the, what do you think is the mechanism for that? So I actually think the public isn't that, I mean, I think the public talks about corruption the way that Larry talks about corruption. I, I, I don't think, um, I do actually think elites sometimes don't. And this reminds me a lot of this sort of split that um, Mark Twain talks about in the Gilded Age, where there's one set of language for the general public, and then elites start to accept as not corrupt behavior, which is obviously corrupt to everybody else. And um, part of that, you know, there's different parts of that elite culture, and I think that's the troubling part. One part is the press, and I think the press is very anxious about calling something corrupt, which is legal. Um, and in fact, one of the most disturbing post-Citizens United uh, features is that when the Supreme Court redefined corruption in Citizens United, after that, the press feels like it can't call anything corrupt that the Supreme Court doesn't call corrupt. So even if you have a reporter who completely disagrees with Citizens United and the logic in it, they're still going to say it's only corrupt if the Supreme Court, uh, according to the Supreme Court's definition, and, which is an, or an explicit exchange. Um, and then when you have the press use this language, sort of reserve this language of corruption for that which is illegal according to this court or illegal according to the 
a federal prosecution, then we don't actually have a shared language with which to revolt and protest. But I think on the general public level, there's a broad understanding that Washington is completely corrupt, and it's had this deeply corrosive effect on, um, on turnout, on engagement, on people's sense of power, because they feel like you know, the promise of the vote is um, uh, not as meaningful when you, you're engaging in a corrupt system. Yeah, Larry, how, can you speak to, just given some of your experiences, how is the media contributing to the problem and how can media think about um, uh, changing the stakes in the way that they express this and, well, and the way they communicate with the, with the polit uh, public at large? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with Zephyr about the characterization of appropriate speak. I mean, it's appro not appropriate to talk about Congress as corrupt at the elite level, especially among the media. Um, and what's puzzling about that is there's just, there's just such an obvious point about how we're using the word corruption that the Supreme Court has not yet grappled with, but which is puzzling because um, our tradition understood this distinction very effectively. There's a difference between saying individuals within a system are corrupt and saying the system is corrupt. You could have a corrupt system filled with angels, <laughs> and you could have um, a, you know, a, a system um, that's not corrupt filled with criminals, right? And you can have what we have in New York, which is a corrupt system filled with criminals. OK, so um, I, but, but the point is, when, when, when I say Congress is corrupt, what, that, what that's saying is I have a baseline conception of the dependence that Congress was supposed to have a dependence on the people, as Madison said, alone, and a recognition that the way we've allowed fundraising to develop uh, produces the reality that they have a competing, conflicting dependence now, a dependence on funders. So that conflict in dependence is technically, literally, quite properly referred to as a corruption of the system, even if you believe none of the people are like silver at the federal level, um, and when and 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 so, it it it's all it, it, it's odd to me that that's a political statement. It's like it's controversial to be able to say that, but it's exactly right. The media won't think about it differently, and one of the reasons is, um, the media just can't imagine it differently anymore. Um, and part of that is that they're all. I can say this now that I'm over 50, they're all kids. I mean, they don't actually have a perspective that's broad enough to recognize the way in which the culture has changed. Same thing with Congress. I mean, Congress is filled with people who don't actually remember a time when they didn't spend 30 to 70 percent of the time raising money, where they didn't see committee chairs handed out as a function of money that you would raise, where they didn't understand that uh, what leadership meant was leadership to drive to raising resources for the party. Um, there are members of Congress who remember a different time, and they are kind of astonished and disgusted by what the institution has become. But everybody has normalized the system, and, and that makes it really, really hard to begin to push back against that normalization. And then you have things like, you know, one of the things the Tea Party did when it um, came to power is that uh, it, it, it eliminated one version of earmarks. They've now come back in a different way, but eliminated one version of earmarks. And the response that happened after they did that was exactly what said in uh, Albany now, well, this is how we did business. Like, this is how things worked. Like, now we can't get anything done because we don't have a way to buy off members of Congress. Um, um, so it's not that they've normalized it, but they've, but they've created it as um, the way the system has got to be. Like, there's no way a, a, out of this corrupt system. They can't imagine the alternatives, and they don't talk about the alternatives. I mean, the striking thing about Zephyr's campaign is that she would use the words, public funding of elections, right? And the world didn't fall apart when she uttered those words. I mean, people got excited and rallied around it. But politicians find it incredibly hard, in, especially in Washington, to use those words. So we've had a Democratic primary for president. We've had two debates, public funding of elections. Those words have not been used once by any of these candidates, even though their platforms plainly point to this as a, a solution. Um, and I think that's a critical step to begin to give people a sense of what the alternative could be to give imagination to the press and then to the public about what they should be fighting for. There's also something strange, I think, which is that the press, the, a lot of the press, and you know, I, I don't want to be accusatory, but there's almost an anxiety, there, there's a discomfort and a fear of being too hopeful about alternatives. And um, there's certainly a received wisdom 
uh, which I think there's a lot of evidence no longer holds that you can't run on corruption. Um, I think my campaign is part of the evidence of that, but I think there's a lot of evidence on, uh, about that, both in polling and in anecdote. But there's a story that that isn't a thing that will engage people. That isn't a thing that will enliven people. And it's sort of a, it's a myth that's passed down from reporter to reporter. And so what that means is that they will then approach candidates with that. And candidates learn very quickly from reporters about the kinds of things that are going to be rewarded and not rewarded. And if it's a not serious topic to run on, that's, that's a problem. I do think that's changing. And just to build on, on Larry's story, one of the things I learned from both his book and then So Much Damn Money, which you pointed me to, was um, I think there's also a sense, well, we, we, since we've always had private financing, what's so different now? But there is a radical difference between fundraising two weeks a year and then right before an election and fundraising 30 to 70 percent of the time. They are both private financing models, but they are not the same in any meaningful sense of what your job is. So if in 1975 your job as a congresswoman is to fundraise two weeks a year and then the two months before your election, yes, you are still beholden more to wealthy interests than not. But it's not your daily job to be a beggar or a sycophant or what I think we have increasingly kind of a court culture in Washington uh, where people learn to uh, all the different subtle ways to please wealthy interests without even really thinking it through. That's really different than what we used to have. And, and I think we have to name that difference and say, yes, we bumbled along for 40 or 50 years with the private financing system, but nobody would ever design a private financing system as the basic way that you want a democracy to work. We just sort of uh, made do for a while, and now we actually have to build something that's sustainable. Um, that, that's a particularly interesting point. I'd like to expand a little bit of, about the problems of, in lobbying. Right? How does the power of those kinds of organizations uh, influence and also extend the potential for corruption? And, and because these are such widespread, I mean, what we're seeing now in Europe, especially in Brussels, is that the type of political lobbying that goes on in the United States was quite small up until fairly recently in Europe, and now it's exploding. And now you're seeing uh, uh, the, the types of large firms that operate on K Street opening up international offices in Brussels. So, so can we talk a little bit about the nature of how that the more insidious form of corruption comes through in these basic, you know, completely legal in most cases, um, and, and, and burgeoning uh, uh, types of pursuits? Yeah, well, I, I think um, there's been a lot of wonderful work talking about the, um, uh, the economy of influence of lobbying in Washington, um, which depends heavily on campaign funding. Um, not because lobbyists are directing or directly giving money, but they are in the middle of directing how a bunch of money uh, uh, is channeled. Um, and, and from this perspective, you've got you to gotta kind of recognize really the awful position that most members of Congress find themselves in. Um, they are denied resources to run their campaign unless they go out and raise it. They are denied resources to figure out what to do as a member of Congress. The, you know, the, the support, the staff support to members of Congress to inform them about facts related to what they are legislating about is terrible compared to what it was uh, 25 years ago. Um, so they are incredibly dependent. Um, and, and when you are in that state of dependence, uh, and a lobbyist walks into your office and offers you know, to channel a fundraiser in your direction or to channel all sorts of informational resources into your, uh, into your office, this is a godsend because it helps you do your work, right? Um, if I don't have to, if, I, you know, if a congressperson doesn't have to raise money because there's been a fundraiser, that means he or she has more time to do the work of being a congressperson. If you now have this report prepared by a lobbyist that tells you why fracking is okay, um, at least you have facts to like, point to and you have things that you feel like you can rely on. And so this system of dependence creates enormous power in the lobbyist. And that power, the lobbyist then translates into enormous wealth because um, clients know that the lobbyists can deliver because the members of Congress are so dependent on the lobbyists. But what's interesting about it is it's actually a system for diffusing quid pro quo corruption. Because there's a relatively small number of well-known people inside the system. 
And, um, and nobody ever has to draw the lines between any favor and any return. So I've got a, you know, a list of clients. I've got a list of desires. I've got a list of resources. All of these things flow, and people understand what the relationships are. Um, but they're never explicit about it. They would be outrageously stupid to be explicit about anything. It just, it just happens. And then the influence produces enormous wealth, and it produces um, um, this incredibly dependent Congress. Uh, and it also produces, you know, one of the questions, I'm sure you got this all the time, get this all the time, is, well, wouldn't term limits be a solution to this problem? Well, what the system produces is voluntary term limits, because what these people are looking for, Jim Cooper, Democratic congressman from Tennessee, puts it this way. He says, Capitol Hill's become a farm league for K Street, K Street, where the lobbyists work. And what he means is everybody has a business model focused on how they're going to get to K Street, um, members and staffers in particular. Um, and so they you know, will have a path, a career that moves through to K Street because K Street is so enormously wealthy and able to pay at a level that, of course, Capitol Hill is no longer able to pay. When I did my book, my favorite statistic was 1972 or 1974, the average salary of a lobbyist was the, was the same as the average salary of a staffer on Capitol Hill. So in that world, why would you want to be a lobbyist? Why not be a staffer? Like, be right there where the, where the power is. But of course, now it's orders of magnitude different. Um, and, and what that produces is this enormous power um, to basically sell, uh, sell power. Um, moving from K Street and lobbying to a world where you would think that there wouldn't be quite the same levels of money and influence, um, <clears throat> I'd love to talk a little bit about what happened at the Brookings Institution with Robert Litzan, where there was uh, research that was produced. Um, that research was funded by a corporation, and uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren had called out uh, the fact that you know, this is suspect. If you've got somebody working in a think tank, the expectation within think tanks being that, you know, these are nonpartisan, or depending upon the think tank, of course, uh, but in the case of the Brookings Institution, that these were, uh, the research that's produced is, is, is not influenced in any way by partisan uh, or corporate interests. And on top of it, that this particular uh, researcher had appeared in front of a Senate panel uh, giving testimony based upon the research that was produced. And this was uh, coming at a time when there was a, a focus there had been, for some of you who may be familiar with an article that came out in the New York Times, uh, about the extent to which foreign money uh, it actually goes into the production of research at, at very well-respected uh, 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 think tanks especially when we talk about global affairs and the influence of the kind of research uh, that is produced in those areas go towards politicians and, and, and organizations. Where does that kind of, you know, can, can, we, can we talk about that as a, as, a, as a type of corruption? Because it's more insidious. It's harder to put your finger in, in the same way that it's harder to give, set the parameters or to name it. It's still something, right? It still exists. So, so in your experience, you know, is, is there a clear dividing line, or does that just become one of these sort of amorphous things that it's kind of business as usual, you have to sort of keep watch on it, but again, if it's not enshrined or codified in law, it's hard to deal with. You've done a lot more work on this than I have, and so I'm especially interested in your thoughts on this. I do think of... Um, and, you know, I, I have a lot more of an American focus. I've spent some time in Bosnia looking at their efforts to have a corruption court, but I really know a lot more about, you know, sort of the, our history here. And I, I, in this country, um, having uh, institutions that have non-profit non aims, that have an integrity or a mission that is different than profit-seeking is really important. That doesn't mean they can't make money. Um, and so the most important institutions, um, you know, universities have traditionally been the most, one of the most important sources of this sort of countervailing power and a place where ideally curiosity is driving that. And I'm very concerned about the increasing role of uh, money engaged in institutions. And I can tell you a very simple, I mean, the, these stories are so simple. There's, there's really grotesque ones, but even as a you know, junior law professor, I might get a call um, from a Google lobbyist who will say, no, I'm not going to pay you, but 
there's an issue that you might be interested in, and we'll do all the research, and you can write an op-ed, and it can be placed um, in your local paper that you care about. And so I get from that, uh, I'll spend the next three or four days on that. I, I said no. Um, but, but just imagine you're a, a junior professor, and you, you might care about these issues, but you might care about 50 other issues. And this will be the issue you're going to spend your time on, because they're going to do the research and give the bones of the op-ed to you. And so it's just so much easier. Or an institution that I really like working with um, gave me $10,000 one summer um, to work on something that I really cared about, uh, which is the private right of action as a, as a um, democratic check, you know, having the capacity to sue. Um, but I can tell you just that experience, I directed my energies again towards the private right of action research instead of the whole panoply of other things that I could, uh, could have researched. And I'm somebody who's really sensitive to these corruption issues. So in these very, I don't, not entirely innocent ways, but really small and important ways, you can see how universities and um, cultures that are supposed to be de designed around curiosity start to gradually, collectively shift in all these different ways to serve the, the, the Googles or the other institutions that don't necessarily have um, this kind of curiosity at the core. Yeah, that's a great example, and the center that I was directing the Center for um, uh, the Safra Center at, at Harvard had a lab on what we called institutional corruption, and a whole string uh, stream of research was done on think tanks in particular. Um, and uh, it is, you know, to to pick out Brookings makes it seem um, too isolated. Um, it is the pervasive system of how Washington has evolved around think tanks. Now, there are very different kinds of think tanks there. You know, I think Brookings and AEI, um, even Cato, um, you know, they have clear ideological positions, and it's not like anybody's going to come in and buy them in a different direction. Um, but it's certainly the case that as these institutions are dependent on private funding to support their work, they've found ever more elaborate ways to cover influence that is plainly having an effect on the research they do, what topics they will address, um, even if it's not directly having an effect on what the answer is that they will, they will come up with. And it, it's on the right and the left. And the Center for American Progress was drawn into the middle of a, a big fight about the fact that they were not revealing who their funders were. And then when, it came, when uh, one of our researchers, Ken Silverstein, did a really fantastic book that brought out a whole bunch of amazing facts about the funders and what they were not saying and what they were saying, it just undermines the credibility of the institutions as institutions that are providing something other than just PR work for private interests. Um, now, you know, people inside of Washington will say, well, that's what they are. They are <laughs> institutions just doing PR work for, you know, we can't rely on the professors. There are people like Zephyr who say, no, 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 I can't take your money and do work. So you've got to create an institution like, you know, a think tank to be able to do that. But what's striking is on the outside of Washington, I think people don't have a sense of the way in which it's become uh, just one more instrument that private interest uses to bring about the relations of public policy that they would like to see our government actually adopt. If you haven't heard this, there's this you know, great saying in Washington about lobbying, that if you're not, let's see if I get it right, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And um, what's really important here is that uh, all of the priorities which just drop out, like dental care for uh, uh, people, just dental care. <laughs> Um, you know, they're just a whole set of really basic needs in a society, bridges, roads, infrastructure, um, that just are not being funded by, uh, uh, who are not funding. Um, and you might have the one-off wealthy person who's funding in this particular area, but as a systematic matter, the basic needs of a society aren't being represented in this sort of set of, of think tanks. An area that I've been interested in recently that in terms of corruption in Washington is the changing role of trade associations. So trade associations were traditionally um, sort of a counterbalance to big business. You have a co collective of the orange sellers. The uh, orange sellers trade show in 1940 was three times bigger than last year's CET show just to give you a sense of how important trade associations were. Um, uh, and increasingly, trade associations, because of their dependency on big 
uh, funders are serving the interests of the big funders instead of the small businesses that they work with. And in an act of sort of supreme, I don't know what you want to call it, the uh, National Retail Federation, which for a long time refused to allow Walmart because it was a discounter, not retail. Um, eventually, as I'm quoting, I wouldn't say this myself, but the uh, NRF person I talked to said, well, we sucked up so long and so hard that we finally got Walmart to um, join. Walmart becomes then the driving policy force at National Retail Federation. And then Amazon, which has interests opposed to the brick and mortar stores, becomes an affiliate member. And as an affiliate member, then can not drive policy at the National Retail Federation, but do what many, many funders do in all of these areas, which is shut down conversation. Because so often, corruption is the purchase of silence, not policy. Um, and so I, you know, and uh, the reason it's important is because, again, outside Washington, you might not know if you read in the paper that, that this or that trade association doesn't represent all the small broadcasters or all the sm small orange sellers, you might still have this sort of vestigial sense that it's, oh, this represents the, the small, small worker, but it does. And so there's an abuse of a history of trust within these institutions. Yeah, and these are people who should know better. Um, so I, I don't want to talk about trade associations now or lobbyists but, or think tanks, but think about universities. Go back to your example. Um, you know, the, you have institution, universities which, you know, certainly not the wealthiest, but, but a lot of great universities in this enormous pressure to raise funds that, that make all sorts of deals. For example, like Penn State has a, um, a food research center um, that's funded by the Hershey's Corporation. Okay, so, um, you know, what, what do the academics in that center feel they're free to do when it comes to thinking about you know, diet as it relates to this kind of, what do they feel like they're free to do? Um, and uh, a bunch of our researchers did amazing ethnography where they would talk to researchers inside of these departments and they were quite explicit about how they just knew there were certain questions they were not allowed to ask. Not allowed to ask, right? And, and and you say, well, what would happen? And it's not that they would be fired. It's not that they would lose their pension. It's just it would make life harder for them inside of that institution. So it becomes a matter of just the smallest amount of courage, like integrity, to be able to say, you know, this is the question I'm going to ask you. This is the work I'm going to do. The funder be damned. And the institution to defend that person against that uh, against any possible consequences that, that is eroding and I think is, the, is you know, the greatest threat we have to these institutions. I don't know if people have seen really fantastic movie Spotlight um, about the child sex abuse in Boston uh, in the clergy. But the great thing about that movie, in my view, is it's about the corruption of the Boston Globe as much as it, it is a film about the problem of child sex abuse because it's the Globe eventually realizing that it didn't live up to its standards to take on this powerful institution when it should have, when it knew, uh, because it was just easier to slot, slip by given the pressures, the economy of influence of what it means to be the Boston Globe in Boston and dealing with the Catholic Church. And this, this recognition of the need to have basic courage, all of us, you know, not courage as a fireman, but courage as just a professional, as a, as a privileged member of society to to push back where we know the influences are, are so easily driving us uh, against what is the interest of our institutions. I think that recognition is something we've got to find a way to cultivate because it's... I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I do also, as, as uh, Larry knows, I do think that some of this is a result of, of especially elites again, sort of changing vision of human nature. Um, in the last 30 or 40 years, and a vision that is a really thin vision that we are all uh, money seeking, not even power seeking, which is far more interesting, <laughs> but that we're all sort of um, profit maximizing entities. And that because that is true, that we should expect this to happen, and we're only going to build systems expecting that to happen. And just to recognize this is a really weird view of human nature in world history. <laughs> 
that um, both certain kinds of more grotesque venality are part of our capacity, but also courage is part of our capacity, public love, integrity, and that sort of the vision of human nature that allows for these institutions to exist is possible. We have had, not perfect, but we have had institutions that hold things other than uh, profit as their highest goal. And we've had other institutions that hold profit, that's fine too, but this sort of, there's an embedded cynicism in the vision of human nature really since the 70s that has reached through, again, most of elite academic culture, not, I think, throughout all of American culture. I think people have a much richer understanding of, of what we are um, elsewhere. That's a fantastic point, and, and I, you know, I was hoping to pick up on the, uh, the trade issues because now as the U.S. faces two major trade deals, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, where there's going to be exposure to practices in other countries and their trade associations, which, you know, it opens up perhaps another dimension in potential corruption amongst domestic trade associations, foreign trade associations. That's, that's an interesting conversa conversation. Maybe we can have that in the Q&A. But before we turn it up to the Q&A, I would love to get uh, a final commentary from you both on what is to be done. I mean, are there practical strategies that we can undertake, whether it's from the public's perspective, a sort of bottom up, uh, 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 initiative, or are there top-down measures? I mean, one of the things um, that uh, uh, we've been batting around in the context of some of the conversations I've had with students here is what if you tied voting, for example, to the ownership of a passport? In some countries, voting is mandatory. You, you, it's, your citizenship is, is tied to that. Um, is that a practical consideration? What are some of the practical ways in which a society as diverse, um, as, as heterogeneous as the US, how can, and, and perhaps even on a much larger, grander scale, are there practical considerations that actually might yield some real reforms, some real changes in, in terms of both the really overt, obvious forms of corruption and maybe perhaps some of the more insidious, more pernicious forms. So first of all, TPP is not a trade deal. Yeah, well, <laughs> it is a constitutional redesign of power. Um, but we're not talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> it would be great for somebody to ask that question in the Q&A. Um, and second, um, there are absolutely practical um, things that we can do. We, we can have public financing of elections. We can have it in New York State in 2017, and it is purely a matter of political protest and political will. That's absolutely, just to get technical, because you guys are New Yorkers, uh, there's a, a significant possibility that we'll have a Democratic Senate. We have a Democratic Assembly and a Democratic Governor. All of the leaders of those three bodies have said they support public financing of elections. Half of them are lying. <laughs> so the, we, it is possible, but it is only possible if you are insistent, persistent, protesting, and very physical. And you know, I, I think actually in-person protests are really critical. And an essential part of this is whatever you're working on, whether it's Let's say that what you really care about is stopping pipelines, or let's say what you really care about is stopping the privatization of public education. You aren't gonna get what you want, even if it feels more emotionally satisfying to just focus on those issues. You can't even talk to um, politicians and have a candid conversation about uh, what's happening with police reform, what's happening with, uh, um, the, uh, with climate change until we, you actually free them from their job as courtiers to really a tiny group of people. So it is our job in some ways to free our complicated lawmakers and demand public financing. And I really believe New York can be one, could be critical. We have it in other states, but it would be a, it, it would change the country if New York had it. It would educate the press that this is possible. Um, and we, when we've had it in New York City, it's transformed the city council. We have a far younger, uh, far more diverse city council, um, and we've really only had it in a meaningful sense since 2009, six years. Far more people of color are running, far more people are taking on the machine ever since we've had public financing of elections. So it, I, we have a special job here in New York State to um, you know, start a, a national movement. <laughs> 
Yeah, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with public funding as the solution. But I think it follows from being very practical and realistic about humans and the, the way humans behave, right? Rather than having this kind of hero Superman conception of people inside of a political system or in a university or in the uh, think tanks or in public or uh, uh, um, in, in foundations, we have to have a recognition that these are ordinary humans who are going to respond to incentives in obvious ways, not just monetary incentives, but incentives about their standing, their status, their welcomeness, or their exclusion, and design systems around this conception of who these people are. Like, what, what, how will they react? Um, and when you look at it like that, it's just bizarre, we would imagine, that having an institution like Congress where they spend such an incredible amount of time talking to such a tiny fraction of America would produce anything other than a Congress that is completely unable to represent America. I mean, it's, it's, it flows once you give up the conception of these people as, as, as um, um, somehow insulated or, or, or untouchable by this. And it's especially, um, you know, one of the tragic uh, 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 outcomes of the research that's been done about the psychology of this is when you are working inside of a do-good institution, um, you are more likely to behave immorally <laughs> because you've given yourself a certain moral license from the fact that you're doing good. So, you know, you're working inside of a nonprofit or a, uh, a think tank that's advancing the truth you feel it's easier for you to cheat on the market than if you were working in you know, another institution where you didn't think of yourself in that particular way. So I think having a realistic, complete picture of the psychology of how people work leads to some pretty obvious ways in which you can fix the problem. So that's number one. The number two part about it is how, how close we are to building the movement to actually getting this done. Um, Zephyr was talking about the way in which the press has convinced itself that Americans don't care about this issue. And, and, and I'm reminded of that every time I repeat a, a statistic from a poll that YouGov did in Iowa, of Iowa Democratic voters. So it said to Iowa Democratic voters, if the next president were certain to do just one thing, just one thing the next president could do, what should it be? And by far, uh, the number one thing listed by Iowa Democratic voters is to fix this corrupted way that we fund campaigns, right? So, so when they constantly say people don't care about this issue, they say they uh, talk about it, but they always rank it down on the very bottom, that was true in the 1990s. Maybe when these guys went to college, that was true. But you know, the, the fact is the system has become so grotesque that it is now a salient issue. And salient enough that somebody ought to be able to light the fire like the match that, that, that explodes it. Um, and, and I'm hopeful we find a way to do that, but uh, we've not yet seen it happen at the federal level in a powerful way. Yeah. Well, well you've done, you, both of you have done quite a lot to light that fire, so let, let's hope that the, the fire starting <laughs> continues. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna, uh, let's open it up to <coughs> questions. I think we have, uh, we've got quite a few. And uh, there are, there's a microphone over there in the back. Maybe, um, uh, uh, maybe we can start here, bring it down in the front row and move it back. Um, uh, we, we have somebody here in the front row. And yes. Thanks a lot. That was terrific. Now, what I was, what I came um, being interested in, seeing the two law professors are going to be talking, people who teach future lawyers and people who teach about the justice system, that America's justice system would be addressed. Uh, from my personal experience and speaking to lawyers, where any pretty much professional is going to confess that the justice system is not designed for justice, and uh, and essentially. Uh, the, the whole thing is should only be understood in Orwellian terms. As judges gave themselves the right to substitute parties' argument, they do not decide parties' um, argument. They decide their parties' cases. They decide their own cases. They substitute parties' argument with its exact opposite, so that they could decide the way they want to decide. It's kind of Alice in the Wonderland world of first verdict, then trial, and um, you, you were talking about courage. What I've noticed talking to my lawyer and talking 
to students, people just get scared when somebody starts criticizing federal judges saying, you know, they're just a bunch of slime balls, which frankly they are. And um, do you, when you teach students the legal procedure, the judicial procedure, if you teach that, you know, how judges arrive at their decisions, do you openly basically say the whole thing is, is a swindle? So no, I don't say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do share the judgment that the American judicial system has been radically weakened by, its, by the overlay of wealth inequality inside of the system. Um, so the, the legal system works OK for the rich dealing with very large money issues. Like it's great for big corporations fighting each other in federal courts. And my experience watching judges do their work uh, at the federal level, I've not had experience at the state level is that in the main, most of them are just doing their job. Um, and doing their job, OK. Um, uh, you know, um, again, I've seen appellate work, so maybe there's something different at the, at the trial court level. But the problem is that, again, these particulars, the problem is the system. The problem is when you've got extraordinarily expensive uh, legal um, infra infrastructure, namely lawyers, um, and uh, a system that takes forever to process these issues. And, uh, uh, and so certain people just can't get justice through the legal system because it's not any more focused on making justice equally accessible um, uh, to all. And, and that's especially true in the criminal justice system, which is an outrageously terrifying system. Really, um, you know, I, I uh, suffered uh, a, a, lo a, a loss of a friend who who was driven to suicide out in the middle of the criminal justice process. But what struck me about that is people who observed um, him, my, this is Aaron Swartz, going into the criminal justice system who were lawyers, I think universally had this fear, feeling that this was a nightmare because there was no way to predict how that was going to come out. It could come out in a completely benign way. It could come out in a completely disastrous way. But the variance was just a measure of how imperfect the system was. But then people outside of the legal system who want to believe that the legal system works, especially you know, techn technologists, people at MIT, had this view that, well, it's a system. It'll all work out. They'll work its way. We'll get to the truth. And, um, and that faith, especially in the criminal justice system, is completely not justified. Um, we have an enormous amount of work to do to bring the justice system in line with the ideals, which um, I think you know, we, we acknowledge. We had a question over here. Professor Oppenheimer. Um, <clears throat> given what you said about this, this slow uh, erosion of standards to the extent that we hardly notice when corruption takes place in, in, in plain view, um, and sometimes political reform movements need uh, and a, a, a precipitating event, um, a Teapot Dome scandal, a Watergate scandal, um, probably not Sheldon Silver, um, as awful as that is. Um, but I'm wondering if, if, if you can imagine some plausible near-term corruption catastrophe um, that crystallizes um, and accelerates this movement, gives it political traction, uh, puts it in the mainstream. She's the forecaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> no, but I, so there's, there's a, a, this is certainly a story that's often told, is that we need to sort of be ready uh, for these, uh, these moments. I, I guess what I think, and I, I take a lot of my hope, um, so this is not a forecaster, political science response. But I take a lot of my hope from um, a game I play where I imagine that it's 1900. Um, <coughs> and in 1900, there has been a uh, civil war. And African Americans have no meaningful uh, access to vote, let alone economic rights. The suffragists have been active for what, 40 years. And women have no right to vote. And the Grangers um, have been shouting about down with monopoly for, for three decades, and basically big banks and big um, railroads. Now, I imagine an organizing meeting in 1900 and saying, OK, what can we plan for? 
And the truth is you can't, and I think if we're too scientific about it, we actually lose the capacity to build the movement. There's a way in which um, you know, one can be actually too strategic. And I think the, it's not that 1901 was that great, but the Teddy Roosevelt came out of all kinds of failed movements. And then Teddy Roosevelt himself was sort of problematic. And you know, until we get to FDR, until we get to the um, 60s, we don't achieve a lot of things. But, but I actually, it's a, I know it sounds like anti-science, but I actually think it is not our job to plan for the movements. And in fact, when we become pundits instead of activists, we actually lose some of the moral strength. Um, and that it is our job to do things like what Larry was doing, which is to say, I don't know what, whether I can achieve a moment right here. But if I overthink it, then I'll just always be hesitating. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why I think it's, it's a, it, it might be an easier problem in traditional corruption contexts than it is at the federal government level. Because I can imagine, you know, Connecticut got public funding of elections after a traditional corruption scandal involving the governor of Connecticut. Um, and that disgusted people so much that they led and they said public funding. I don't think that it's conceivable to have such a scandal at the federal level because nobody needs to engage in criminal activity to get everything they need out of that system. You're an idiot if you engage in criminal activity at the federal level. Um, so, so if we need to wait for a, a crime, we're going to be waiting for a long time. What we have to do is to build a movement that doesn't have to be motivated by the simple black and white crime versus not, but instead um, you know, aspires to a moral value which we all see is not there. And I, you know, I've been struggling to see how we get to that conception of a moral value, because the reality is talking about campaign finance reform or money seems so geeky and so you know, technocratic. You know, it's just like a... Um, and, and what I think we need to get to is a recognition that this is a symptom of a much deeper inequality that we've allowed to develop in our political system. Like, the reality of the way we fund campaigns is an expression of a deep political inequality. Um, and, uh, and not just. I mean, I also think you know, the ridiculous way we gerrymander and comp compose the House is another expression of that inequality. But I think that if you look at the arc of history of America, the most successful movements for reform have all been equality movements. They've all been movements that have been about getting people to wake up to their entitlement of being treated equally and fighting for it. Um, now, you know, oddly, it was easier to do that in some conceptual sense when it was racial inequality or sex inequality or sexual orientation inequality, because the other is clear, right? Um, um, this inequality, the inequality of citizens that has manifested itself inside of our political system is harder to rally people around because everybody kind of, especially, you know, white males, we all think we're all doing fine. Like, you know, we have the vote. Like, what could the problem be? Where is the inequality here? But the inequality is as grotesque as it is, is, is conceivable, right? In, in a system where 158 families have given half the money in this political process so far, That's a scandal. That, is, that is banana republic democracy, right? Um, and, and yet getting people to the place that they feel viscerally the wrong of that, the way an African American felt the wrong from segregation, or women felt the wrong from being denied the right to vote or being forced into particular positions, or gays felt the wrong from being unable to express their love openly, to find a way to get that visceral sense of injustice in front of people is our task. It's not to wait for the criminals. It's to enliven in ourselves a conception of, of moral rightness and to fight for it. Uh, let's have um, let's have a couple of questions in the back. There's there's somebody in the back over there. And I was wondering if you could get a mic. Um. So here's my own view. Um. I think the most corrupting influence, so this may not directly answer, but it's sort of a, it's my pet project, I guess, is, 
um, I, I think we have an increasingly feudal economic system um, with a handful. Most corporations, I think, are fine. Um, most corporations, whether it's Joe's Pub or, uh, you know, the vast majority of corporations have owners who are using the, the corporate form to protect against liability and for a few other reasons. And there's a handful of corporations that have extraordinary outsized power. Uh, one set of language we might use for them is monopolies. That's sort of a language that has been used in the past. That doesn't mean one. but And I think what's really hard around the debate around corporations is that I, some people use anti-corporate as the dividing line, when in fact, I think usually our anxiety <laughs> is around a certain set of corporations that have unbelievable outsized power. And they themselves then are tempted to uh, corrupt politics. Because once you have, I, you know, I imagine if you are, um, if you're Comcast, you know, I sort of make this joke that like, is Comcast a cable company that happens to do politics, or is it a political entity that happens to provide really bad cable? <laughs> but if you are the head of Comcast, and you're just looking at the bottom line, your temptation in this terribly broken system we've created is to say, it's better for me to spend $5 million um, buying influence in Washington than to spend $5 million uh, building better cable. Like We've built a system that actually encourages the, the best CEOs, and a lot of them aren't the best, um, but to uh, engage in this corrupt system. So I think one of the other practical things that I would really focus on is returning to a pre-1981 antitrust where we basically didn't allow companies to exist if they had more than 5% of the market share in a certain area. And if they were going to be essential to our economy, then we require some degree of a high, high, high degree of, of regulation. So I, I don't think corporate is the line so much as the nature of the, of the corporation. Yes, um, let's have um, in the middle of the room, uh, the gentleman in the black sweater. So you're recording this, right? You yes, get yes, a mic. if you could get the mic to me, please. Um, just sort of taking the pessimistic view for a second, but obviously I think you both agree that the uh, cor you know, corruption has been deteriorating over time. So. If left unchecked, what's your worst fear for what our society will look like in 20 years' time? Uh, yeah, the so question, the question is, 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 so left unchecked. So if left unchecked, what's, what's going to happen? What's the worst picture here? Um, I, I think it's very simple to understand what's going to happen in America. Um, America is going to be unable to address any of the important problems that it has before it, and everyone acknowledges it needs to address. I mean. Um, Francis Fukuyama's latest book talks about America becoming a vitocracy, vitoocracy, um, and by that he means that you know we've we've combined this design of a constitution with all these checks and balances, and an influence game, and I would say the biggest part of this is the way we fund campaigns to produce a world where a tiny fraction is capable of blocking any important change. Now that's different from saying we've been taken over by an aristocracy or a plutocracy. Because you know, in a certain sense, it would be better if we were an aristocracy. Because at least there would be a consistent set of values <laughs> that would be guiding the country in one direction or another. I mean, not the democratic values, but still there'd be some logic to it. That this system isn't a, a system of capture. This is more the, you know, the analogy of um, vultures feeding on the body of a dead gazelle, right? Because it's basically everybody getting what they can, blocking any effective ability to deal with really critical problems. And so, um, you know, we squander our economic future. We, we, because we can't address these issues rationally, we spend enormous amounts of money in defense and to be the world policemen and imperialists all over because that turns out to be a really profitable for some people, and they happen to be people really driven inside of our system. All of these things, I think, tie to our inability to be what we were to be, which is a, re a representative uh, democracy. And, um, and you know, you pick your list of things that worry you the most, none of them get fixed. I think, it, you know, here in New York State, what you see, um, uh, this is the joke I was telling in that article that you said, this is the sort of the joke that's told everywhere is the, Bureaucrat from one country goes to visit a bureaucrat from another, so we'll just use New York and uh, Illinois. So, 
the Illinois, uh, the New York bureaucrat visits the Illinois bureaucrat, and uh, you hear this like throughout the world, this glo the global you know humor and corruption. Uh, and he says, "Wow, you have a really nice house. Where did you get the money for this really nice house?" And the, the Illinois guy says, "You see that bridge? Ten percent." And then ten years later, the Illinois bureaucrat goes to visit the New Yorker, and his this mansion, it's gorgeous. And he says, where'd you get all the money? And the New Yorker says, see that bridge? And the Illinois guy says, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the ultimate cost of corruption in New York State, which we've already seen, is people, we've stopped building. We are not building the Erie Canal. We are not building renewable energy systems. We are not building the MTA. We're not building anything. We just stop. Instead, because so many of the so much money is just spent on sort of taking money from the tax code, it's sort of like you know this is what Apple's genius is is taking money from the tax code. So I think it is radical inequality and real lack of health and real lack of education. It's a, a quasi anarchistic system. But to Larry's point, I think what is so sad is that there, this is a tragedy in the Greek sense, and that this isn't what anybody wants really. Maybe a few people, but. It's the, and the, the, the part of the tragedy that uh, I see, although there's a lot of part of the tra well, a lot of different parts, is that in the classic tr tragedy story, the thing which is your greatest virtue becomes your greatest weakness. And so this, in some ways, the Supreme Court's use of the First Amendment, our greatest virtue, this extraordinary gift to be able to speak freely, is then turned against us. Um, to not allow us to uh, experiment with public, with, we can experiment with public financing, to be very clear, but experiment with other, <laughs> very important. Um, and, and then there's other parts of this tragedy. And I, you know, I do think that it's, that's why it's solvable, because there's not that many people who want to live in, a, in the sort of dystopia that you're talking about. I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's, uh, I know, it's so, so fascinating. We could go on all night, but uh, um, uh, how about uh, the gentleman here in the blue shirt? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it seems like public financing of elections is a big theme here, and it seems like that would obviously solve a lot of problems. My question is, given what we've spoken about earlier with K Street and lobbying and that kind of influence, does that solve that problem or significantly mitigate it, or is that a separate issue that requires a separate solution? So um, I actually think it goes a long way to solving that problem. I mean, we don't want a world without lobbyists. I mean, that might sound odd to say, but we do want lobbyists in Washington. We want people there who know facts, who can provide information, make arguments about how a certain bit of legislation will help or hurt different communities. That's important. What we don't want them to have is the outsized influence that comes from also being effectively funders. So as John Edwards used to say, when we used to quote John Edwards, there's all the difference. <laughs> in the world between a lawyer making an argument to a jury and a lawyer handing out $100 bills to the jurors. And our lobbying system doesn't understand the difference between those two. So if you had a system of small dollar public funding, um, um, the lobbyists would lose an enormous amount of their power right now because the members of Congress might still want the report on how fracking helps or doesn't, but is not gonna depend on that lobbyist in the same way um, for funding campaigns, which means that they will exist, but they won't exist as this super profitable industry that they are right now. The, uh, I agree. I don't think it solves the whole problem. I think the importance of other institutions, like media institutions with integrity, uh, universities with integrity, those really matter too. Um, but the, uh, to, to Larry's point, the story in Connecticut when they passed a public financing model is the on budget day, which is the day that all the lobbyists used to come and collect. And, and basically, if you were a lawmaker, you had to let the uh, you know take big fossil fuel industry lobbyist in because nobody had to say anything. But you knew if you didn't meet with them, that might affect whether you raised money. The story in Connecticut is that um, you'd see all these after they passed public financing, all the lobbyists were hanging outside the bathroom door on budget day because that's the one way that you knew you could run into the lawmakers. <laughs> so that instead of having automatic access, the access came when the lawmaker wanted it, not when uh, ExxonMobil wanted it. OK, I think that uh, I think we're going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately. And um, I just want to um, thank our guests again for providing a fantastic conversation on political corruption.
And thank you all for joining. Uh, I believe there is going to be a little reception. We have some, we have some wine and we have some cheese. So, so please feel free. And uh, thank you all again for coming. And we'll see you next time. You should run.